NFR Extra follows all your favorite cowboys, interviews legends of rodeo, and talks to the best of country music. Follow Nevada Caldwell, Ryland Bentley, and Steve Godert every week as they delve deep into the stories behind the road to gold in Vegas at the National Finals Rodeo. It's revealing, comedic, and sometimes emotional. Find it on Spotify or anywhere you listen to podcasts. NFR Extra. All dirt, all rodeo, all year. I guess to be a little bit sappy, when you come to Pendleton, it feels like you're coming home for a lot of people. I mean, there's people just welcome you in and, you know, people give up their homes for people to come to town. They, they'll they live in their fifth wheel trailer or their camp trailer or a tent in their backyard and let somebody come in and live in their house just so they have the great experience of Pendleton. The, you know, we have some iconic restaurants um, that uh, people want to come visit, the Hamleys and Simiotis and there's just some great places to eat but Pendleton's a I would call it an old west town but it's living in today there's you know it doesn't look like uh, the downtown of Wall South Dakota or you know Deadwood or some of those places where they have really preserved what it was like in 1871 but they preserved what it was like in the early 1900s when Pendleton Roundup was here so we still have a lot of brick buildings and we you know we still have the underground tours and things like that so pendleton woolen mills and so there's a lot of icons that are in pendleton that people just want to see the only thing that i can com- if you want to go to a great rodeo there's 632 other of them. if you want to go to an event you come to pendleton roundup because it's it tells a story of um, and the camaraderie and the people that you meet there's, we have volunteers that come from New York. We have people that uh, come from around the globe now just to come to Pendleton Roundup. And I think it's that uh, f- that family feeling they get when they're here is they meet somebody that becomes a lifelong friend. And it's just hard to reciprocate that in a lot of other places. NFR Extra, episode 105. This fifth generation Eastern Oregon farmer and rancher has seen his fair share of challenges since becoming the president of Pendleton Roundup. Randy Brocker talks about preparing for the iconic rodeo's 111th run, his family's beginning during the industrial revolution through the millennium, and the significance of the Cowboy Channel PRCA deal. Pendleton, so you went when you were little? So we actually went, I probably, I don't even know how old I was, I was probably, Eight, the first time we went through, and I don't really remember that time much, but we probably went again. I was 11 or 12 with me, my mom, my dad, and brother. It was us four. We were traveling back from like a family vacation or something because we were up there, and my dad was like, I want to go by Pendleton because that was one of the rodeos that he just didn't get to fight. And um, it's such a surreal setup, even when there's nobody there. Like you walk to the gates of Pendleton. And you kind of sit there and there's this giant bucking horse, just statue, right? And then you have the gates and the grandstands and the shoots that everyone's talked about forever and the colors. And it's not normal. It's a very different setup for any of it. So as a rodeo kid, like I'd seen all these arenas, but Pendleton being so different, I'd, I've been to the arena, I've seen it, you've seen the town and you see these old nostalgic buildings in a sense, like. These Western stores have been there since the wars and since these, pla- you know, I'm, a, I'm kind of a history nerd. I'm terrible at remembering it, but I love going to museums and seeing it and seeing and where our world comes from. And I think our Western heritage is just so important to remember and learn that Pendleton mm-hmm. holding so much of it. I'm, it think about just... how they're attached to World War II, right? Like you have two, well, besides the pandemic, but the two times that the Pendleton actually shut down had everything to do with World War II and actually servicing World War II, which is pretty awesome, I think. And the steel, right? Like, yeah. you don't even think about those things as today. Like, we just, I hate to say this, but so many people just assume everything comes from the store. Like, people don't stop to think, this has to come from somewhere. There's farmers, there's manufacturers, there's 
people pulling this material from the mines to process it, right? Like you don't think about how much it really takes to operate in this world we live in. And it, it's fun to go back and see these small towns that hold so much history. I mean, even Las Vegas, like pieces that didn't exist anywhere else, right? Like the neon lights, all these things that for the first time ever people were seeing. And still today you come into this town and see lights. I mean, when you fly into Vegas at night, it is a surreal moment when you look out that little window and you see the strip of the lights and the buildings and yeah. the reality of how much goes into that architecture. And maybe that's being like the construction side of my family. You see the architecture that goes into these buildings and knowing how much it takes to build these facilities. Well, now you backpedal a hundred years ago, like Pendleton, you think about people building this grandstands. How did they start designing these things? Let's, let's design this arena. Let's to do this for our community and i think they played football in it for a short period of time so yeah, they did. like like you think about those pieces and you're just like how did this all come about like who were the masterminds that truly sat down and were like you know what this is our design we need it this big we're going to do nine buck and shoots i don't know if it's only nine i know there's a minimum of nine I don't know, it just, it fascinates you. And as a little kid, I mean, I guess I wasn't a little, little kid, but I mean, as a young person, you see this and it's huge. You're just like, wow, someone made this. And it's that old, like it genuinely holds so much. I don't know, I guess my grandma, the best way to put it is like, my grandma always tells me like, we have this table in our living room or dining room that is a hundred plus years old. It's like the third generation of our family. It's the heirloom that passes down, right? There's a table and a china cabinet. And she always says, man, if wood could talk, if wood could talk in the stories it could tell about what has happened at this table. I always think about like those old Deadwood, South Dakota, the grandstands or wood, you know, the Pendleton Roundup, this whole building. And you think about like, man, if wood could talk, could you imagine the stories it could tell of yeah. the people that were in these facilities? Well, and you the history of Pendleton is pretty fascinating in itself, right? I mean, like just where it sits with the rodeo world and it's become like a bucket list for- It's people. a bucket list. Yeah, for even outside of that, just to say that you went to Pendleton. Yeah, I know, I agree. It's a cool spot. If I could go every year, I would. It's a fantastic place to visit. Rodeo is just one slice of the pie, Happy Canyon. You know, everything else that wraps around it is pretty awesome. Enjoy our conversation with Randy Brocker. Listen to the end for Last Call with Steve and his good buddy, NFR announcer, Andy Silent on NFR Extra. Finding your custom NFR experience in Las Vegas just got a lot easier. New This Year is a resource that links you to every hotel offer. At nfrexperience.com forward slash stay your way, you can shop for the hotel that best fits your plans. Everything is there. Information on viewing parties, concerts, price, transportation, location, and so much more. All in one place. Go to nfrexperience.com forward slash stay your way. One Vegas. Stay your way. Hey, this is Chancey Williams, and you're listening to NFR Extra. The fifth-generation Eastern Oregon farmer and rancher, Randy Brocker, didn't set out to become the Pendleton Roundup Association president. So when he was asked to run the most iconic rodeo in the country, he kindly accepted knowing the challenge would get him out of his comfort zone. In the late 1800s, James Paul Doran, Brocker's great-great-grandfather, migrated from Europe and began to form north of Helix in Oregon after receiving a couple of quarter sections of land instead of money for his railroad work. The family expanded its farming footprint with each generation, still abiding by the core values taught by Randy's ancestors of hard work, integrity, and conservation. This fifth-generation farmer, is rearing the sixth generation of farmers by the same virtues. Brocker is a boots on the ground type of person and would instead let his work do his talking. Randy Brocker, president of Pendleton Roundup. Welcome back to NFR Extra. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me. How are you guys doing? Obviously, it's been a just a very interesting year the past couple of years, not to try to reflect on that too much but just things are rocking and rolling in vegas obviously in oregon you're heading towards your your first pendleton uh roundup since the craziness let's start off first this is something that we didn't get to do last time we had you on i mean we talked a little bit about this but i don't think we dove too much in it you're a fifth generation eastern oregon farmer rancher why eastern oregon 
What, where does that come from for the family? Um, well, my dad's side of the family was, uh, uh, worked on wagons and windmills in the Midwest. And the kind of the joke is, is that, uh, they got kicked out of Ohio because they were making moonshine in the back of their windmill shop. And so they moved to Oregon and, uh, his grandparents started a carriage and windmill shop in Helix, uh, which is about 25 miles North of Pendleton. And, uh, that's where kind of roots set up um, on that side. My uh, his mom was a school teacher. My the farm and ranch come from my mother's side of the family. Our homestead is up in the Blue Mountains, settled in eighteen late eighteen seventies, um, mostly Finnish heritage. Um, they had the first uh, pulled Hereford cattle this side of the Rocky Mountains. Realized they couldn't winter cattle at roughly four thousand foot elevation, and so uh they uh, moved down to lower country couldn't really afford just to buy land and so they went to work for the railroad and uh helped build a railroad line from pasco washington to pendleton oregon instead of getting paid in uh cash or dollars you got uh paid in land and so that's how they we ended up with the lower farm and then we've just expanded from there and um and about 2005 2006 my dad retired and interestingly enough, uh, partnered up and has a distillery in Pendleton <laughs> that he's running. So it's kind of came full circle on my dad's side of the family. Um, we're pretty diversified. Um, since my brother and I came back, I graduated uh, from Oregon State in uh, 1999, ag business, uh, minor in crop science and rangeland management. And uh, I've always had a, I'm going to call it a cattleman's bug and a horse bug. And I married uh, into that as well. My wife um, loves horses and livestock. And so we're, my kids are into it pretty deep. So my wife and I run a small commercial cattle operation. Um, we help out a lot of our neighbors with their cattle duties, but we also uh, are a diversified farm where we grow grass seed and uh, corn and seed corn and sedan grass and wheat and uh, alfalfa. Uh, so, 33 circles, um, irrigated, uh, running on, and then we do a lot of dry land farming as well, of uh, dry land wheat um, and uh, Austrian winter peas. Uh, so we're a pretty diversified farm. My brother, I actually went to work off the farm for a couple of years, and uh, my brother came back to the farm when he graduated in 2000 and said, man, we've got some opportunities to lease some more ground because my dad made it ultra clear to me and my brother um, that he wasn't going to give up two thirds of his income just for his boys to come back to the farm. So we need to figure out how to pay for ourselves to work here. So we went out, picked up some leases, did some, I would call it off farm income where we were spreading some vegetable waste on some farm ground, um, for productive benefit and nutrient resources, um, which helped out some of our lower rainfall ground. Um, we got into business with a company called machinery link and we were a combine staging area for a pretty large combine leasing company out of the Midwest. We were the uh, West Coast hub for them. We'd run about 250 combines through our shop on an annual basis. We did that for, oh, three or four years. And then we got into the irrigation business in uh, 2011, I think it was. We had a 150-acre pear orchard for a while down in Hood River. We sold it uh, last year, a year ago, June and uh, expanded our irrigation base and just kind of adding on to the farm and staying a little bit closer to home. So As man, that is a mouthful, Randy. I mean, just from <laughs> going back, because I actually have read quite a bit about your great, great grandpa, correct? That came yeah. from Europe. He came at a time, obviously, when the Industrial Revolution was kicking in. Clearly, that worked out for the farming industry. But then, you know, you're in Eastern Oregon, not too far from the Pendleton Roundup. At what point in time does... There's a lot of activity going on in rodeos, festivals, if you will, community festivals, which is what Pendleton uh, began as. At what time does the family ties start to cross over to the Pendleton Roundup side and rodeo? When, did, when does your family get involved with that or do they? You know, it's it's not nearly as a cool story as I'd think. But um, so my grandfather and his dad actually raised mules for the military. And so um, 
back in the uh, 1900s. Uh, my grandfather was born February 1916, and so up until the 20s, early 30s, as that industrial revolution came along and we started getting mechanical, they were raising mules, breaking horses, things like that for um, pulling wagons, etc. And they'd take them down to the railroad spur and ship them back to Kansas um, for the military. And that was part of their winter income. And uh, then, so my grandfather got involved um, in Roundup, really just as everybody or a lot of people do in this community is just volunteer and they you know they wasn't trucks and semis back then so they'd have to go gather the horses and they'd have to go gather the cattle and things like that and they'd have cattle drives and horse drives essentially to get them to Pendleton to the roundup grounds and so that was my grandfather's involvement um my mom and dad and well have always instilled in my whole family I've got uh, two older sisters and a younger brother we we're really involved in community growing up um, with, you know, whether it's church um, or 4-H. We we're heavily involved in 4-H growing up. And uh, we went to, I went to high school in Hermiston. And Hermiston and Pendleton are about 25, 26 miles apart. Um, but uh, we live north of each town, which is basically halfway in between. <clears throat> but uh, my dad was on the Happy Canyon board, which is the sister organization to Pendleton Roundup where they put on the night show and uh, the X Bulls event this year and he was a uh, director over there I was asked to be a volunteer in um, 2000 because they were looking for somebody to help uh, sort uh, cattle uh, behind the chutes and uh, some of some pretty good livestock experience so Joe Talbot asked me to like, come help and uh so our, our steep tradition in uh, Roundup is uh, really at a 10,000 foot level. We, um, my, I don't have any family members that were directors um, prior to me or any generations ahead of me, but they're always involved. The one thing that my parents have always instilled in us is, you know, community support, community effort, you know, whether it's going to the soup kitchen on Thanksgiving Eve or Christmas Eve and helping feed the hungry, things like that. So they're... 4-H involvement. I was a 4-H leader for a while for an archery and trap shooting club that my brother and I put together. Um, so it's just community support. And this is just one of the things when they asked me and if I would be, would like to serve on the roundup board and serve on the roundup boards. It's not, uh, you just throw your hat in the ring and they say, okay, come on and join us. It's actually a more like a job interview. I mean, they, you have to send in a application you have to be nominated by a sitting director um you have to sit in front of 17 board members and they ask you a menagerie of questions of your involvement and, um, you know everything about roundup and about your personality and what you like to do and then uh, then their next board meeting they vote on you and sometimes you win and sometimes you don't and they you know if you pass a muster you uh, come on the board and I was fortunate enough my first year that they ran me I got on the board I was in so 20 fall of 2012 2013 was my first panel at the roundup so I've been on the board for nine years now Wow! and it's the roundup board is two four-year terms and then a presidency of two years and for extra with president of Pendleton roundup Randy Brocker December in Vegas. What does that mean? It's time for the Wrangler NFR and the Cowboy Channel Cowboy Christmas, the ultimate shopping and entertainment experience. Catch live shows on the Ariat Rodeo Live Stage, the Yeti Junior World Finals, autograph sessions, and much more. Open daily with free admission at the Las Vegas Convention Center. Visit NFRExperience.com for details. The Cowboy Channel Cowboy Christmas. It's all here. Hello, everyone. It is Jordan Tierney, Miss Rodeo America 2020 and 2021, joining you on NFR Extra. Randy Brocker is here on NFR Extra. And now you are the president. How have you steered this experience through kind of an interesting time when you took over? So, uh, kind of like alluded to, it's you got to have a really good team behind you. And that's one thing that 
Pendleton Roundup is very fortunate to have. It's a great team. We have a great volunteer base, a thousand plus volunteers. Um, also relying heavily on some past leadership. Um, as you can imagine, in a farming and ag community, there's a lot of farmers and ranchers that are sit on that board that I've known since I was knee high to a grasshopper, and so um, have become really close friends with them. And uh, they served on the board, so I've bounced ideas, asked questions. Um, Dave O'Neill, who was a president prior to me um, for two years, he and I became really close friends um, through being on the board and kind of. Uh, when I was livestock director and he was arena director, <clears throat> worked very closely together. He works for Pacific Power here in Pendleton, um, but loves a Western way of life, loves rodeoing. Um, he's a team roper, avid team roper. But an uh, interesting story about him is uh, he is, uh, uh, he's from the, as he says, the hood of Las Vegas. He was born and raised in Las Vegas, Nevada. And so to what some of those things that I, and this is probably getting a little bit off topic, but some of those things that I take for granted of being raised as a farm kid or out in the country, being on horses all the time. And it's something that he really worked his butt off to find a place that he could settle down and rope and play cowboy the rest of his life. So it's kind of a fun John Wayne story. Hey, I'm all for being from Las Vegas and rodeoing. <laughs> Definitely is, makes a lot more sense to head to Oregon, though, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, so it gave me some perspective, but through, so I, to go back to your base question, the, the other thing is I had a, Tanner Hawkins being the president of Happy Canyon, um, he's a fellow farmer, lives up the road, I call him a neighbor, but he's almost nine miles away, um, he's the fourth house on the left, but he's, uh, he was somebody that I don't know if, it would be a struggle to have somebody else leading that side of the, uh, on the Happy Canyon side and me being present around up that he and I communicated a lot and to really keep our chin up um, going through what we went through in 2020, you know, we start planning for roundup essentially the Monday after uh, the first Monday of the month after roundup. So the first Monday in October is our first board meeting. We do kind of a cleanup, make sure everybody's got good notes on what to do for the next year. And then we start planning for the following year's roundup. So we had our foot on the gas. We were in overdrive 18th, um, planning Pendleton roundup. Um, our board meeting was the first Monday of March and the hints of coronavirus were out there, but didn't think much of it. Then um, the 8th of March, I think it's kind of the, I call it the D-Day of, uh, at least in Oregon, of when what we found out what coronavirus was like, what this COVID-19 deal was going to do. And really, I'll be honest, kind of laughed it off. Okay, let's um, make some plans. What's our alternative plans? But this shouldn't last until July, maybe August. We'll be in good shape by then. But let's at least make sure we have some safety precautions in place. Started. Um, you know, we met a couple times with our county commissioners and our county health department and get through April. Okay, this is getting serious. Gets to May. We're like, oh boy, this could, uh, you know, this could really set us on our heels. What is it going to look like if we don't have a penalty roundup? And Tanner says, I don't think we're having it. And it's no disrespect to Tanner, but he's a realist and I really appreciate it again, going through him with going through this whole venture with him. And I'm like, no, I'm optimist. Uh, we're going to, we're going to have roundup. We've got to have it. This community needs it. Then uh, tail end of May, we had a meeting with the governor's office and she says, you know, things are looking good. This COVID-19 is really a, an outbreak and it's making a lot of people sick. Um, there's no vaccine out there for it yet. Um, I just think it's best that some events aren't going to be able to happen. But, uh, you know, September's a long ways away. So keep planning, but just be cautious to pull the ripcord just in case. Two weeks later, we had another phone call with her, and it had changed to, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, we appreciate um, all the work you guys are doing. We said, all right, let's put together our plan and we'll send it to you. So we put together a 27 page document 
that had all of our safety and health protocols in it of social distancing to more sanitation stations, uh, how we were moving around people, how we were moving around concession stands, how we were going to enforce masks and all that kind of stuff. And it was, uh, it was enough, but it wasn't enough. So then in two weeks after that, which would have been about the, I think it was the 7th or 8th of June, we called her again. And so what are we, they're about 16th, 17th of June, and called her again. And she's like, nope, this isn't going to work. I'm sorry, but uh, we're not going to be able to have your event or you're not going to be able to have your event. And so I think it was the 18th or 19th of June, we told the world um, back up a little bit to about the middle of May. Um, Tanner and I were um, working together on this um, plan of what if and what if not. And the what if was, well, if we don't have Roundup, what can we do for our community that, um, you know, to try to prop them up, help them out? Can we, there's got to be either a fundraising effort or a community gathering. Now, this, after this is all over with, if we can't have Roundup, there's got to be something um, that shows that Roundup still cares about its community and the community still cares about Roundup you know, one of those things, because our mission statement for at Pendleton Roundup is community support. And we give a lot of money for scholarships and, uh, you know, a lot of clubs raise money, Altrusa and Lions Club and Kiwanis and Shriners. There's just um, several service organizations and school clubs that raise all or most of their money just during uh, the week of Roundup. And so we knew there was going to be a blow for Kiwanis raising $12,000 to give for scholarships to students in Umatilla County or Lions to help out those with sight problems or hearing impaired or Shriners to, you know, the, the list goes on of people that they can help or school clubs that won't be able to buy jerseys and things like that so they can travel to baseball games or uh, dance competitions or, you know, there's all that kind of stuff. So we're trying to think of what we could do. And so we decided, well, let's just put together a small community, a couple from the Roundup Board, uh, or a small committee, a couple from the Roundup Board, um, and a couple from the Happy Canyon Board, and let's pick on some guys that have been uh, exceptional leaders that served on the Roundup and Happy Canyon Board years past. Because my hesitancy of having it all inclusive of Roundup and Happy Canyon Board was when you uh, had to pull the ripcord on that. June 19th and said, we're not having a Pendleton roundup. And it still kind of brings a tear to my eye every time I say it. But we didn't, when you let the air out of the room like that, that on a team between both of our boards, there's 29 directors, 17 roundup, 12 on Happy Canyon, is that you let the wind out of the air out of the room, who's still going to be passionate? And it's nothing against them. But we also have other things that we have to focus on for roundup. Um, and Happy Canyon of day-to-day -day operations or some, whether it's bylaw changes or things like that that we could clean up that I want a team focused on that. But let's work on this community effort as well. So we started, it's called Letterbuck Cares um, and started raising money for the community and just thought, you know, if we could raise, first goal was let's see if we can raise $300,000 and give it to um, the organizations that um, need it here in the Pendleton Roundup at Happy Canyon Grounds. Again, like I guess mentioned earlier, our Kiwanis, our ser service or organizations, our not-for-profits, um, our ball clubs and sports teams and things like that at the high school level. I think within, we announced Letterbuck Cares the day that we announced we were not having Pendleton Roundup. They're the tail end of June. Um, in a matter of two months, we raised over $350,000. And so we kept meeting, trying to figure out what's our next benchmark. And so let's say, well, man, let's see if we can, let's just shoot for the moon and see if we can raise a million. And uh, up to December 31, we had raised $936,000 for the community of Pendleton. And uh, we gave most of that away, um, to what would have been Friday of Pendleton Roundup last September. And then uh, did a, another push, and uh, all that money went to the community. That is cool. 
Yeah, yeah. If there was a highlight of, of uh, I would, you know, we've won large outdoor rodeo seven times since I've been on the board. We've been, or six times, I guess, since I've been on the board. Uh, 2015, we run the PRCA Remuto Award, which I'm very proud of. But the Letterbuck Cares and the community that got behind it um, is probably by far the the high watermark of my tenure on the Roundup Board. You're listening to NFR Extra with our guest, Randy Brocker of Brocker Farms. Let's take a quick break. NFR Extra follows cowboys, talks to legends and country stars, and finds the stories that make up the season that leads to the annual showdown in December. Follow me, Nevada Caldwell, Brylan Bentley, and Steve Goder as we delve deep into the stories in and behind the road to gold. Listen to NFR Extra on Rural Radio, Channel 147, on Sirius XM, every Monday at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 Eastern, with a re-air Tuesday in the same time slot. NFR Extra, all dirt, all rodeo, all year. Hi, my name is Brent Sutton. I'm uh, with Sutton Rodeo and one of the NFR pickup men, and I'm joining you on uh, NFR Extra. Randy Brocker here on NFR Extra. Now, I read this wasn't the the first time that Pendleton got canceled. There was twice, too, right? During World War II, is that right? World War II, 42-43, they canceled because Pendleton Roundup Grounds was the uh, a recycling facility. So it was a steel drop off for the steel drive. So they canceled Roundup in 42, 43, and everybody brought their scrap metal to the Roundup grounds. And then they loaded it on trains and trucks and hauled it to Portland for the steel drive for the war. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Was there any guy like old timers that were, you know, that would still be alive to share any of that with you? Or is that no? Uh, yeah. the Actually, the Grand Marshal of our parade this year. Uh, Bob Stanger, uh, he was actually uh, part of that war effort, and uh, he's got some great stories about it. It's pretty cool. Nice. That's awesome. How about as you float into 2021, still crazy, but how has this been just because and the reason why we get to dive into this, well, we've done this with a few folks, actually had Mark Purdy on uh, talking about rooftop rodeo. And I think for some that listen are like, oh, you don't want to talk about COVID or the pandemic or whatever, but I think what's interesting to find out is how has everyone adapted through this process? Because there's so many kind of things that you're learning about your business or about yourself and how you make something better. How has it been getting to this point where we're talking to you today, getting ready for 2021 Pendleton Roundup? Uh, the, I would say the bell curve got a lot tighter from planning for, you know, you, you've got you're either pumping the brake or you got your foot halfway on the clutch pedal and you can smell smoke, but you're not sure what it is. So that's really the way that I explain it. Um, the, we, we've been, we've ever since last year, even after not having around it, we've always been looking forward to 2021 and, but making sure that we're going to have all the correct safety um, PPE um, sanitation, all that stuff, just in case. We'd rather have it than not have to scramble for it. So we've been in constant contact with the governor's office. We've been in constant contact with our county health officials. And we have a doctor that sits on our board that, um, that's been very helpful with us. We have the lieutenant for the state police uh, for the local office. It's been her- very helpful. So we've got a great team of solid minds that understand we just can't jump off a bridge and say, you bet we're going to have roundup and throw caution to the wind. Being the size of event we are, um, we understand that there could be a magnifying glass on us. So we're, we're optimistic. Um, and now we've got the go ahead to have a full roundup. We're just going to have to have a mask mandate in place inside and outside. And we're going to push that hard. And, um, you know, when you're not drinking or eating or, which is tough to do at Roundup, but uh, that uh, everybody's safe and that um, we're going to show some community spirit, spirit, community pride, and enjoy all the what Pendleton Roundup has to offer. And I know you're not one to teach your horn, man. I've read plenty about you. I had plenty inter- people interviewed about you. You are, for no doubt, are going to be in the history books for Pendleton Roundup as far as being in this area and how you've had to navigate. I mean, congratulations on getting to this point. And I mean, obviously this, this rodeo is epic. So it's just congratulations on getting to this point, Randy. <laughs> well, thank you. Give me a, 
give me two and a half weeks and I'll really celebrate. I think I'm just, <laughs> I, you know, we're 10 days today. We're 10 days away. Um, a week from this coming Saturday will be our uh, kickoff parade and our kickoff concert with Billy Currington. And uh, I think that's going to be the, really the moment that I get to sit down for a second, and take it all in just for a minute. Um, you know, when you have a, <clears throat> we have what we call a roundup Bible. Each director has a roundup Bible where they keep all their notes and everything that they need to do, um, who their volunteers are, who they need to contact, things like that. Just your playbook of uh, in that directorship. And you, when you go off the board or you switch directorships, you pass that playbook on. The president's one is two, now two three ring binders. And I've got it passed to me from several generations of presidents. And as soon as we started thinking about not having Pendleton Roundup, I scanned through those pages very diligently. And there's not a damn thing in there that says anything about not having a Pendleton Roundup. So it was everything you guy had to draw your blueprints on your own. So it's been fun, but it's uh, it's been interesting. You have to have some patience. You have to, I've learned a lot, everything from politics to brushing up a lot on my political correctness <laughs> and the like, but uh, I've probably frustrated some people at times, but I've made some great friendships and met some people that, you know, may not see things the way that I see them um, on the political side, but getting through this whole COVID thing as um, is a, is a target that everybody should be aiming for. So I don't, you know, politics or not, I try to stay out of the side of it. I just have to get into it sometimes on a local or state level. But it's really just because there's not a governor or, you know, a, a local leader or anything that has the magic answers. You know, maybe that wonderful uh, governor from South Dakota might have it figured out. But um, other than that, it's it's been a it's been interesting. I have to have three email accounts. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Ew, that sounds awful. That's super busy. From your perspective and, and kind of what you live year, year in, year out, getting this thing ready for, for all the, the epicness of it, what makes Pendleton Roundup such a bucket list for the Western enthusiast? So a couple of things. One from the, I guess, to be a little bit sappy. When you come to Pendleton, it feels like you're coming home for a lot of people. I mean, there's people just welcome you in and, you know, people give up their homes for people to come to town. They, they'll they live in their fifth wheel trailer or their camp trailer or a tent in their backyard and let somebody come in and live in their house just so they have the great experience of Pendleton. The, you know, we have some iconic restaurants um, that uh, people want to come visit, the Hamleys and Simiotis, and you know, there's just some great places to eat. But Pendleton's a... I would call it an old West town, but it's living in today. There's, you know, it doesn't look like uh, the downtown of Wall, South Dakota or, you know, Deadwood or some of those places where they have really preserved what it was like in 1871, but they preserved what it was like in the early 1900s when Pendleton Roundup was here. So we still have a lot of brick buildings and we, you know, we still have the underground tours and things like that. So I have Pendleton Woolen Mills. And so there's a lot of icons that are in Pendleton that people just want to see. The only thing that I can, com if you want to go to a great rodeo, there's 632 other. Of them. If you want to go to an event, you come to Pendleton Roundup because it's, it tells a story of, um, and the camaraderie and the people that you meet. And there's, we have volunteers that come from New York. We have people that, um, come from around the globe now just to come to Pendleton Roundup and I think it's that uh, f that family feeling they get when they're here is they meet somebody that becomes a lifelong friend and it's just hard to reciprocate that in a lot of other places. NFR Extra with our guest Randy Brocker from Pendleton Roundup. After this break we'll wrap up our conversation. The Yeti Junior World Finals. 
he is back in Vegas. From December 2nd through 11th, the next generation of rodeo stars will compete at the Cowboy Channel Cowboy Christmas, held daily inside the Wrangler Rodeo Arena. Visit nfrexperience.com for details. Looking for tickets to the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo? StubHub is the official secondary and fan-to-fan site of the rodeo. Fans can buy and sell their tickets through a safe and secure online marketplace. Visit nfrexperience.com. Hi, I'm eight-time world champion bull rider Donnie Gay, and you're listening to NFR Extra. This is NFR Extra, and our guest, Randy Brocker. Now, for those that aren't able to actively be in Pendleton, Oregon during this event, there's a partnership with the Cowboy Channel. Can you touch a little bit on how that changes things up for those that aren't there? Yeah, and I can get as deep into Cowboy Channel as you'd like because I happen to be as well on the PRCA Media Advisory uh, Council that is helping I'd say steer that ship of uh, Cowboy Channel and RFD TV and Rural Media Group. Um, yeah, they can watch it on uh, Cowboy Channel Plus app. Um, and that's been a, a great thing, in my opinion, for rodeo. Um, I think there has been a huge shift from other professional sports to rodeo and the Western way of life. And they understand Patrick and Raquel and that team understand that they're just on the very tip of the iceberg of where this is going to go, or maybe it's at the bottom of the pyramid, but they're just getting to what's going to make greatness in my opinion for that channel. So people can watch rodeo, you know, almost 24 hours a day, but understand and get a grasp of the Western way of life. And um, I think there's been a great shift of, um, from viewership, from people going away from other professional sports to it. And now it's just how to fine tune it of what people want to see. You know, we, I think they um, alluded to at the beginning was that we need to have the school teacher that was in the Olympics or, you know, the, the gal that delivers the mail that is in the um, pole vault of the Olympics. You know, they tell those stories. And I think being able to tell those stories draws people more into the sport and then also telling the story about the community because I think each and every community that they have a rodeo in that they film if they when they tell that story of the community of Pendleton or the community of Sykeston or Houston or whatever it people all of a sudden man I I want to go there I want to see that they just give me gave me just enough of a taste of it I got to go see it I, so I think there's a benefit not only to the rodeo itself that when people see it on TV they're going to want to come be a part of the crowd and be a part of that enthusiasm but also if they can't be there during roundup they can be there they can come in june or they can come in at some other time and come enjoy what Pendleton has to offer or any other community around the globe or in the rodeo business absolutely. yeah well absolutely and you think about your place you know with the coverage you know here's the, the crazy part when you think about what they'll do with you right they can cover all because i remember eating in a house when we were in pendleton it was some two-story house there was a bar in the kitchen. It was awesome. The food was fantastic. It's unique, right? In Vegas, that you're not going to get that. You're going to go to the Strip, right, or, or the Fremont downtown uh, Las Vegas. So, like when you start thinking about the rodeos and the ability to bring in these kind of these cool cultural items that are attached to the rodeo, that was never happening before. You know, you never had the rodeo fan have this. Like we were talking with Brylan not too long ago about this, where it's always on at her house. You didn't have the ability to do that before, where you know CBS or whoever it was before that was. You know, that the Fordham game versus Dartmouth was probably more more important for them to do that than run it run the NFR. And it was like, well, if that's where you're at, you we're missing a whole boat of fans that appreciate the heck out of this. And now you get to expose even more people through this process. So yeah, that's yeah, if you want to watch the NFR, you had to do it at one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It's, it's justice for everybody, that's for sure, in the rodeo business. Yeah. So it, it's been a I'm proud of them for stepping up and doing it. I'm proud to be a part of that team. I've, I'm, you know, being a part of that uh, council, I get to give some, I'd call it constructive criticism or positive feedback to them on what works, what we'd like to see, because I, uh, being a rodeo fan, uh, as well as being on a board, but I want to see it succeed, you know, in future years and uh, being an armchair Bronc rider, whatever you want to call it, 
that you can sit there and you can say, man, it, wouldn't it be cool if they did this or if they did this? You know, I, I really like, I'm a fan of bucking horses. And so I really like it when they have the name of the contractor and the name of the horses on the screen. That's one of the things that I always, I always think should be on the screen yep. um, every time somebody gets on there. Just those little nuances, just to improve it, I think um, would make the, just make, create more fans. It allows enough content to be provided to be a fan. You get to follow along and start studying and remembering those names and those that are involved, whether it's rodeo contractors or athletes. Like it's just a wraparound of everything that we truly have in this industry. Yeah. And it's a, you know, it's a tough sport to follow. Yeah. Uh, where you have so many events um, and so many contestants. It's not like PGA golf where they have, you know, what is it, four tour events or whatever it is that are the their big ones for the year you know you've got a lot more than that um but even the smallest of the rodeos in baker montana add up to a lot when it gets to the nfr and so um how you tell that story and then the different uh, the way that uh, different rodeos have different formats you know where you watch houston that starts with calf roping compared to Pendleton that starts with bareback riding like most of the other rodeos or you have a bracketed style like San Antonio San, An San Antonio and uh, Cheyenne where Pendleton's um, three days and a short round on Saturday so I th all that uh, all those nuances that uh, people have to focus on but I think the prize at the end um, no pun intended is to get all the people to understand that there's a champion at some point, but there's also those school teachers or the post office workers that can be the champions that also help people get involved in the sport and and, and get that next fan um, to watch it, come to your town, be entertained, things like that. Ask questions. Yeah, education creates confidence, right? And you were going back to talking about it's it's a hard sport to watch. It's not a it's a fun sport to watch, but if you don't know what the heck's going on, you're not going to have a lot of confidence in like talking to other people sitting with them. Like, I have no idea what's going on here. That dude just held on for dear life. And I just, I thought he won because I know I can't do that. But you know, as you watch, if you're getting educated and, and man, that broadcast does a great job of that. It really, yeah, adds to that. <laughs> you know, there's, you, there's some comedy to it because you can have someone say, well, God, why don't you watch golf? And I said, well, I can say that bronc riding, and golf are similar. One guy's chasing a little white ball. One guy's chasing a gold buckle. And one guy has to work eight seconds at a time. And that guy has to walk for four and a half hours on a golf course. But they're all chasing the same little white ball, the same gold buckle. And so it's it's whatever trips your trigger to be entertained. And that's what rodeo is, is an entertainment business. But the physical, um, the physical activity that it takes to do it is – you know, over four and a half hours or over eight seconds. It's just uh, it matters what how big a toll you want to take on your body. I'll bet you there's a lot of bull riders and bronc riders out there that probably won't want to swing a golf club once they retire. <laughs> Most because they can't get their arms over their head. <laughs> that is a good point. All right. Before we wrap this up, though, I'm going to test your knowledge on Oregon itself with some true or false questions. Okay. Oregon has the most llamas in the United States. Boy, I don't, is it the most or the second most? I'm going to say that one's false. I think they're the second most. It is true. One fourth of the country's llama population call Oregon home. I'll be darn. That's good to know. I knew it was up there. <laughs> Next one. The smallest park in the world is Mill Ends Park in Portland. That's true. That is true. It is only 452 square inches. That is crazy. And it was recognized in 1971. Pretty crazy. Statistically, Oregon is the least religious state. Boy, I'm going to say false. It is false. What would go up to your neighbors in Washington? Last one. Well before Phil Knight started a shoe empire, Oregon was home to the oldest shoes in the world. True. True. In 1938, about 70 pairs of 10,000 year old sandals were found in a cave in central Oregon. It took 70 years for researchers to realize they had found the oldest shoes in the world. It's pretty amazing facts. Why is there shoes in a cave, Nevada? I, totally. <laughs> Who looked? 
There was probably about 15 other crazy things about Oregon. Oregon actually had a lot of interesting stuff. You know, we've done this for what, Georgia and I think it was Australia. Australia was definitely Australia. Yeah, Australia was super bizarro. But yeah, yeah. the deepest lake, the deepest canyon. Yep. I got a couple on Pendleton that'll throw your mind. Pendleton Roundup sells more beer than any other venue west of the Mississippi River minus University of Oregon football. That's a lot of beer. The Letter Buck thought, Room is the largest bar in the state of Oregon, and it's only open for one week. I was going to say, I actually believe <laughs> that very easily, knowing our rodeo crowd in Pendleton. So that's pretty legit. <laughs> We're running out of sponsors for AA. <laughs> Randy, this was awesome, brother. I know you got a lot going on, and we appreciate your time, and good stuff here, man. Well, thank you very much. No, I'm uh, it was actually, I've got a lot going on, but it's nice to sit down and breathe for a minute and actually try to just think about Pendleton Roundup and talk about um, Pendleton Roundup instead of have to reply to texts and emails and questions and concerns and trying to keep this uh, large ship on in a buoyant situation. Good luck, man, and thank you for coming on, and uh, we'll catch up soon. You bet. Thank you. you bet. Thanks, guys. All right. Better back. All right, Desperados, last call. I haven't been this excited for 21 since I myself was 20. <laughs> because all of this just... It, it yeah. is last call. The only problem is we're sober. <laughs> exactly. Let's do this. All right. You go for the Texas is bigger and Saltgrass didn't disappoint with Tito's Texas Tea. Yeah, for you alliteration fans, here's three teas in a row. Cheers, brother. Oh boy. That's a way to start your morning on a hot day. Yeah, that right there is uh, an apology to my mom here in about 30 minutes. So, why do you have your uh, phone out? Dude, have you ever read messages or tweets that somebody writes post one of your, what you think is like a highlight? No, you haven't. I don't read the comments. <laughs> yeah, you should. I should? Yeah. Okay. And uh, some of them burn. Okay. And that's why we're gonna dive into that burns. So what you got? All right. I once saw a cartoon of Steve and thought it wasn't realistic. After meeting him in person, I realized the artist did the best he could do. <laughs> that's pretty mean. Okay. I bet the only thing softer than Andy's voice is his girly hands. Hashtag be a man. My hands, are they that soft? Oh, Don't touch me oh, with them. Okay. That, that's, that's mean. Uh, yeah. It's hard for me to be mean, but Steve makes me want to give up sobriety. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not giving up. All right. Uh, I hope Andy has a dog and it eats chocolate and throws up in a pair of his boots. <laughs> what? Hashtag you suck. Who are these people? I thought trolls was just a movie. I didn't know no. it was a real thing. And if they're if they're robots doing this, man, those are some <laughs> mean programmers. Uh, there are some real beefcakes in rodeo. With Steve, I see the beef, but where's the cake? <laughs> This is going to be gone sooner than I thought. Okay, Uncle Tito. Oh. Someone as short as Andy needs a milk crate to stand on and see out of the announcer stand. But Andy just needs to quit announcing. <laughs> Hashtag get a real job. What's wrong with a milk crate? I'm sorry. Listen, listen, I'm going to put this out there. 5'7 is worldwide average for height, okay? I'm sorry that there's steroids in some of the food in America. That's why 5'9 is the average here. <laughs> Anyways, give me my milk crate. Oh, God. Steve looks like the guy who came in honorable mention in a sushi eating contest. <laughs> That's hurtful, man. Yeah, but you eat a lot of sushi. I I'm mean, the look, guy, let's... man. Yeah. Honorable mention. Who won first and second? All right. My sister. <laughs> I hope that horse Andy is announcing off bucks him off so I don't have to see him or hear him anymore. Hashtag you ain't no cowboy. Hashtag you suck. Who 
are these people? I'm Get here. a life. Obviously, somebody that's been to Jeez watch you announce Louise. the rodeo. It's not nice picking on short people. Oh, here's a good one. I'd love to criticize Steve on his rodeo announcing ability, but he doesn't have any rodeos. <laughs> okay, back to Uncle Tito. All right. Watching Andy announce next to Roger at the NFR reminds me of bring your kid to work day, but you still have to work and the kid gets in the way and you want to send him home. Hashtag bring back Wayne? <laughs> <laughs> Who? Th that's just hurtful. I can't do it. That's anymore, hurtful. Man. Listen, that's I got the much. buckle and I'm not giving it back. So suck it. Oh. All right. Well, that burns. Thank you, trolls. We want to give a huge thank you to Randy Brocker for hanging out with us on NFR Extra. Want to experience more of NFR? Then visit nfrexperience.com. And we invite you to subscribe to NFR Extra on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you're listening right now. If you like what you've heard on NFR Extra, we would love it if you gave us a big five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe. NFR Extra. All dirt. All rodeo. All year. Gotta make it out to Vegas, where the big boys roam. With the rovers and the racers and the bulls and the browns. And the ladies in the skin-tight wrangers and the cowboy 